greener than to be. He is the creator of the most successful British comedy of all time, shown in over 100 countries. He holds the world record for internet downloads and has sold over 7 million DVDs. He has won two prime time Emmys, three Golden Globes, and eight BAFTAs, and now has the fastest selling live tour in British history. So, please, welcome to the stage, all the way from London, the Podfather, the Podcomedy that is the English King of Comedy, Ricky Jarvis! Spent the entire budget on that. Just me and a microphone now. Look, not even a co work unbelievable. Oh, it is fantastic to be here in the greatest city in the world. Thank you so much. Oh, this is my, um, my second night in New York. I did uh, a few gigs in uh, Los Angeles, but uh, a lot of those we donated the money to the um, uh, American Cancer Society. So this is better because I keep all the money. So, uh, but we did raise thousands of dollars, or hundreds of pounds, whichever way. <laughs> What's it like being a third world country? <laughs> oh dear. I know what you're thinking straight away. Ricky Gervais, are you still doing stuff for charity? Shut up. No, don't. What? I do too much. No, I don't. <laughs> what? How much did I raise for cancer alone last year? It doesn't matter. Why is it? Give us a ballpark figure. <laughs> Millions. Millions. And they are welcome to it. But I will say this, if I ever get cancer myself, I'm going to walk into the nearest hospital and go, right, I paid for that machine. Get that little bald fucker off it. <laughs> Talking of little bald fuckers, I did the teenage cancer gig last year. It, what? at the uh, Royal Albert Hall. I did it before, I did it in 2006, but they called again um, last year. We're still ill. Um, you lasted. <laughs> um, no, it's a great gig, um, and the, the teenagers with cancer getting free and everything, that's the sort of guy I am. And um, they sit in the front row, oh, lucky little. And uh, they get to come backstage afterwards and meet me. What a treat that is for, for them. So much better than going to Disney World, where the rides can make you sick if you're in that state. So meeting me, it's thumbs up. So, and I was doing the gig this last time, and uh, I looked down and I recognised one of them. I thought, oh yeah, he came backstage two years ago. He was telling me about his illness, and I signed some stuff for him, and he said, oh, he just turned 18 and how hard it was. And I was thinking, well, that was two years ago, so now he must be 20. So how the fuck is he still a teenager? <laughs> Lying little shit. He wasn't lying about the cancer, he was riddled with it, it hurt him to laugh, but he shouldn't... <laughs> so I was doing the gig, and he was laughing along, and I thought, yeah, you laugh it up, mate, I was fuming. <laughs> and it got too much for me, and I went, all right, mate, I recognise you. He went, oh, you came backstage two years ago, and yeah, yeah. He said, you're 18, he went, yeah, so you're 20 now, he went, yeah, I said, get out. <laughs> and I called security, and they, he struggled, but he was weak, they worked out, you could tell. They, <laughs> Although they had trouble getting hold of him to start with, but then they, they got him and they, they pulled it. His drip nearly had someone's eye out. Uh, I went, get him out. The crowd started booing. I went, hear that? They don't want to see someone like you take the piss out of me. Off you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Cheers, everyone. That's a big can, isn't it? I'm not showing off. I want you to know that is a big can and I'm not a dwarf. From the Oh, I did a big um, charity gig last year for autism, 
And like most people, my only experience of autism until recently was Dustin Hoffman's brilliant portrayal in Rain Man. But I've just got this new house in London, and the neighbours were coming round, going, oh, yeah, hi, poking their noses in, basically. But I thought, you know, I'd be nice to them for now. When I get a big gate, they can fuck off. Um, <laughs> and uh, one couple, they've got an autistic son. And the mother was talking to me and said, oh, this is Douglas, he's 17, and he never goes out because he hasn't got any friends. So I thought, right, OK, this is where I can show him that, you know, I'm a rich, handsome man off the telly, but I've also got a heart of gold. <laughs> and I said, oh, I'll take him out. I went, really? I went, yeah. So I went back on the Saturday, true, um, and uh, she said, oh, he loves the zoo. And the zoo's only about a mile from my new house in Hampstead, I live. And uh, so I'm walking along the street with Douglas, OK, and he doesn't take his eyes off his mum all the way along, all the way along the street like that. And his mum's in the doorway, and she's waving to him, and she's crying, right? Eventually, she shut the door, and she goes indoors. I hailed a cab and said, right, take us to the casino. <laughs> so, you've got to make it work for you, haven't you? So, <clears throat> I signed him in. He had a little suit on and everything. I thought, this is going to be brilliant, OK? I went straight to the blackjack table. That's their best one. I don't know why. There's, they're, they're brilliant at that. Um, I went, OK, Dougie, you know the score. Bet two for good and one for bad. Do you understand? He went, yeah. I went, ooh, ooh, ooh. So I was, I was betting. I was about £1,000 down in half an hour. And I went, sorry, hold on. Douglas, do that thing. Count the cards. Do that thing. Tell me when there's a good card coming. Tell me bet two for good. Do you understand? He went, yeah. Another thousand pounds down. I thought, what sort of an autistic? So, I, I was confused. I threw some toothpicks on the carpet. I said, how many went? I don't know. I said, the seven. I can see the seven from here. Oh, wow. Why did I get that one? So I took him back home and I said to the mother, there's been a mistake. He walks like Rain Man, but he's got none of that clever shit. I know it's wrong, <laughs> but uh, I don't want to talk about it, but I do do an awful lot for charity. Um, <laughs> but I think some causes are more worthy than others. Joking aside, obviously cancer is a very worthy cause, autism is a very worthy cause, but I got asked to do a benefit gig recently for sufferers of obesity. What? <laughs> she went, sufferers of obesity. I went, do you mean fat people? She went, no, because obesity is, well, she actually went, no, because she was eating. She went, she went no, just, you know, between snacks, right. And uh, she went, obesity is a disease. No, it's not, is it? You just like eating, don't you? <laughs> no, it's not, is it? How is that a disease? Oh, I'm so fucking ill. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I'm well ill. I'm well ill. Ugh. I said, what's the disease? She went, everything tastes good. Uh, everything? Yeah. Not salads, but... <laughs> it's not a disease, is it? <laughs> Leprosy is a disease. <laughs> Can you imagine Jesus in the temple? People shuffling up to him in bandages going, Jesus, my face is falling off. I can't stop now. There's a fat chick on a third pie. <laughs> People say they make excuses, don't they, fat people? They say, it's glandular. It's not glandular, it's greed, OK? It's big bones. Yeah, big bones covered in meat and gravy. <laughs> they complain, and it's their own fault. Oh, I'm getting fat. Oh, oh look, I'm getting fat. Oh, oh, aeroplane seats. <laughs> they're not big enough for someone like me. No, they're not. Because if they were, we'd only get 12 fucking people on the plane. <laughs> it's not fair. It is fair. That's what does it. And if we're talking about fairness in aeroplanes, why is it I get the same luggage allowance as a guy who's 400 pounds? We're both allowed to carry on 32 kilograms to the plane. Oh, I don't know. He used up his 32 kilograms on his tits. <laughs> Not a disease. <laughs> I saw a documentary back in England about this woman who was 350 pounds because she ate 10 burger and fries a day. That'll do it. <laughs> 10 separate meals of burger and fries. 
ten separate trips to McDonald's, right? In a cab? Oh, didn't even walk that. <laughs> Wasted calories, okay? So, to stop her eating these meals, they wired her jaw together. So she liquidised ten burger and fries a day. <laughs> now she's on burger smoothies. Now she's not even chewing. That used up three calories. <laughs> So, lo and behold, she gets fatter. So, they admitted her to have that thing done where you staple your stomach together. And she's sitting there in hospital, looking all depressed. Well, you can't eat for an hour before an operation, can you? <laughs> Lank hair, smock. Christ knows where they got that, right? <laughs> and she said, it's a really dangerous procedure, but it's the only option left. <laughs> One, jogging? <laughs> you don't even walk. Right. Uh, salad? You don't like the taste. Three, nine burger and fries a day? <laughs> it's a start, isn't it? It's a start to her. Jesus. We have, uh, we have some fat people in Britain. But um, you, like everything else, are, are the gold medalists of that as well. Right? <laughs> You'd win that in the Olympics. I saw this episode of Jerry Springer. It was called Jerry Springer Saves the World's Fattest Man. You've got to watch that. <laughs> so he's there going, OK, let's try and save this guy's life. He's got a heart of gold as well. He's like me, right? So, <laughs> so it cut to this guy at home in his house. They couldn't bring him to the studio. They had a camera crew there. And I say house. He was in a trailer, obviously. And um, <laughs> he was. He was. He was like a big blob on the bed. He sort of filled the tray. He looked like an un uncooked souffle. <laughs> and it was... You could just see the, his eyes in this doughy mess. And he was going, I don't want to die, Jerry. I don't want to die. And I felt sorry for him. I got over that. But... And I said, how much do you weigh? And he, and he weighed a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds! Now, my point is this. When he weighed himself one day and he was, say, 500 pounds. <laughs> Didn't he think then that was a lot? <laughs> Didn't he go, that's a lot. <laughs> For a human. <laughs> For what is essentially a land mammal. <laughs> that's a lot. I'll only have eight breakfasts today. I'm not having a go. I'm not, I'm a little bit overweight myself. The other night someone shouted, no shit. I thought it could be that. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great? You go to the doctor, he goes, no, you're not overweight, you're just constipated. <laughs> Woohoo! Start again. Um, I'll tell you uh, quickly, I had to go to the doctor um, for, this, for this tour, for this um, medical, I say tour, it's LA and New York, they're the main two, I didn't do the middle bit. Um, <laughs> nothing wrong with the middle bit. I, uh, if you're watching the DVD. Um, <laughs> I love the middle bit. I love the middle bit. I love all of America. I do. Um, <laughs> I do. I've got a film coming out. Now, listen. <laughs> no, I, I had to have a medical. And um, I've had medicals before for TV shows, and they check your pulse and go, fine, you're not going to die in the next six weeks. Go ahead. But... Went along to Harley Street and he said, oh, it's a bit more thorough than usual because it's, you know, it's a high insurance risk, this big gig. So I went, fine, so we need a urine sample. I went, yeah, fine. So he gave me this little file, right? And I went to the toilet, filled that up, good as gold, gave it back to him. Still warm. <laughs> That's embarrassing, isn't it? Oh, I know he's a doctor, it's, a bit, it's wee, but when it's, when it's cold wee, it's sort of just chemical. But when it's, when it's warm wee, it's sort of biological. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's from my body. That is warm because of my body heat. Some of which is probably willy heat. Do you know what I mean? No. But it is. I'm not, I'm not saying I've got a, a very hot penis, but I'm... No. I, it's the same... What I'm saying is, it started off as core temperature, but then had to go through the willy, which, which kept it warm. Like a lagged pipe. And it was only a very short journey, so it lost... <laughs> it's fine. It's average. I don't know. Um, I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's, uh... I'm five for eight. It's in proportion. It's fine. 
It's fine. It is. Absolutely fine. There's nothing wrong with this. It. Um, I've got nothing to compare it with. I've, uh, mine is the only one I've seen. I haven't seen it for a while. <laughs> Doesn't matter. Um, I'd look silly with like, a two foot cock, wouldn't I? I'd look ridiculous. It would look ridiculous. Oh, look at my big cock. You look ridiculous. You look ridiculous. You were better with the average one. Whatever size it is, it looks fine on, on me. I don't, also, if I had a two foot one, I'd faint every time I got an erection, which would be. I'd just be lying there with no blood in me, just this cock. It's fine. It's, I've never thought about it before, but it's, it's. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. It's fine. It really is. I don't. Now I'm worried that you think, oh, what? It's just. I, it's. <laughs> if you saw me naked, you wouldn't go, that's the tiniest cock I've ever seen. You fucking wouldn't. You wouldn't make. You'd, You'd look, you go, as a naked man, you, know, you wouldn't have to squint. I don't know why I did that. I don't, I don't know why I did that. I, you wouldn't have to squint. You'd go, there's his penis, it's fine. It's fine. And the doctor can't tell you because he's taken an oath, so you'll never find out. Okay. So I gave him the, the wee, okay. The hot, wee, hot willy wee. <laughs> from, uh, my, just from my bladder and average penis. And the, um, he went, thanks, right? <laughs> Loving that. Anyway, so, and then he went, oh, um, uh, can you strip down to your underpants? I went, okay, so I stripped down to my under... Oh, well, fucking hell. <laughs> Someone's parrot's escaped. <laughs> so he said, can you, can you strip down to your underpants? I went, good as gold. Oh, for f The one day I wear white underpants. Big wet patch from the wee. <laughs> Well, look, why did he warn me? Why did he say, be careful, I'll be checking your underpants in a minute? You don't check your underpants, do you? Do that, you put it away. Maybe that always happens, but I've never, I've never had a wee. Then go out and go, better check my underpants. I've never, that's the first time I've ever had a post-wee view of... So, I thought, oh, how embarrassing. He's, he's checking the wee, and he's going to turn around any minute, and he's going to see what... And he did, I, he saw it straight away. He, he sort of went like that and looked away, right? <laughs> And I tried to hide it. I was one of those pairs that just to slit, and I tried to pull it over, but it pinged back, and he saw it. He even had to touch it when he said cough. It was really embarrassing, okay? <laughs> but why am I telling you? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, oh. anyway, so that happened. I wet myself, basically, in front of a doctor. Okay. I went, I went home, and I told my mate, I said, oh, what happened? And my mate said, you should have gone commando. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, that would be much less embarrassing, wouldn't it? So, according to him, I should go, oh, no, I've wet myself, what can I do? Oh, I know, I'll take them off too. <laughs> That's as dry as a bone dock. <laughs> should have gone commando. Do commandos not wear pants? No, he, do com no, commandos must wear underpants, mustn't they? He wasn't... Why aren't you wearing underpants? <laughs> what? I'm a commander and I'm wearing underpants. <laughs> I've never heard of that. I've never heard that phrase before. <laughs> They're going to see that. <laughs> At least. <laughs> oh, they're definitely going to see it now. There's barbed wire. You're going to lose that. <laughs> Should have gone commando. Thank you. <sighs> I'm a bit overweight myself, but I never worried about it before I was famous. And I'm not vain now. It's that you read about yourself. And the papers, they need an adjective. They can't just say, Ricky Gervais, comedian. They say things like, Ricky Gervais, tubby comedian. <laughs> what? Why say that? Why? Why bring that into it? It's like, you can't get more specific than your entire name. You know what I mean? Uh, who's going, Ricky Gervais? What does he do? Comedian. Ricky Gervais, comedian. Fat bloke. Oh, I know, yeah. <laughs> One paper called me Rotund Comic. I'm not rotund, am I? There was a picture 
in the two English papers this weekend, okay, a paparazzi got me in Los Angeles, and I was just sort of standing like that, and it was in the Daily Mail and the News of the World, and they put a question underneath it, is Ricky pregnant? <laughs> I've been referred to as a chubby funster. That's like a gay porn name, isn't it? <laughs> oh, here comes the chubby funster. I was jogging once, right, with my iPod on. Yeah, looking good, right? Paparazzi got me, full page in the paper the next day, with a headline, iPodge. <laughs> Cheeky bastards. <laughs> anyway, where was I? Oh yeah, all the charity work I do. I don't want to really talk about it, but I, I do. <laughs> One of the first big charities I got involved with, um, years ago, was when I worked at the University of London was the Terence Higgins Trust, which is the big AIDS charity in, um, in Britain. And it was, um, it was sort of mid to late 80s, so people were still like, oh, what's this new thing called AIDS? What's this? Oh, it's gone from strength to strength now. It's doing very well. It's gone global. But <laughs> got its own day and everything. 1st of December, World AIDS Day. I don't think it'll ever take off like Christmas, because it's, <laughs> it's got a wrong vibe about it. Um, and the card companies are Mr. Trick. They're usually straight in for anything, aren't they? And you, can, you, can't, you cannot get, sorry, you've got AIDS cards. They don't exist. You're, or one that plays a little tune to cheer someone up, a little relevant tune. I don't know what a relevant tune would be, but I'm a nine-stone cowboy. It doesn't, it doesn't matter, but I won't do this in San Francisco. Um, I am... Um, because you had a bad gay. Oh, shut up. Shut up. No, but... I learned a fascinating fact when working for the Terence Higgins Trust. People always learn stuff from my lectures. Um, <laughs> this is absolutely true. The first HIV virus was actually a combination of two separate viruses that joined in rhesus monkeys and made this rudimentary form of AIDS. And this was passed to chimpanzees. Sometimes chimps will get a bloodlust and eat a rhesus monkey, and it, it sort of evolved and mutated in chimps. And because we're 98.6% genetically identical to a chimpanzee, it was able to be passed to humans. And the first human contracted AIDS when he was chopping up chimp meat and he cut his finger, although that's the excuse I'd have given as well. You'd have to come up with something when you go to the doctor and you go, I feel terrible, doc. And he goes, well, I'm not surprised. You're the first human to contract AIDS. How would I got that? <laughs> Two ways. <laughs> One, you were fucking a chimp up the arse. <laughs> Me? <laughs> fucking a chimp up the arse. No way. <laughs> How else could I have caught it? I don't know, you could have been chopping up chimp meat and cut your finger. That one. <laughs> Choppy, chimpy finger thing. I bet he went straight into the jungle and found that chimp. I went, you fucking gave me AIDS. I gave you what? You gave me AIDS. I gave you a blowjob. Shush, shut up. <laughs> I got AIDS from you. Well, where did I get AIDS from? From eating monkeys. I don't eat monkeys. <laughs> You're either eating them or fucking them. I was eating them. <laughs> but the greatest thing I learned when working for that AIDS charity was that this is the best leaflet in the world. Okay? This is a real flyer that came round, issued by the Terence Higgins Trust. Okay? It came round uh, the university I worked at in about... 1989, okay, and uh, it was aimed at the last demographic of gay men who still weren't taking precautions. They treated HIV like an occupational hazard, and they were militant against the disease, but they wouldn't take precautions. So it's aimed at that last tiny demographic, so it's very hard-hitting. The front cover is a bunch of bananas with the word fuck. I don't know why, I don't... <laughs> and it's basically a ten-point plan of uh, health advice to not contract HIV. And this is the... This is the title of this flyer. You know it's going to be good when this is the title. Okay? Ready? You know, you don't always have to have anal sex. <laughs> it's good to know, isn't it? Think of an old couple in a doctor's waiting room. Just looking through Reader's Digest and she goes, Oh, what's this? Oh. You know, you don't always have to have anal sex. See, I fucking told you. 
OK, and it's uh, basically ten suggestions of, uh, of alternatives to that little act. OK? I'll just read some to you. Number one. <laughs> OK, this is real. OK. Number one. Why not? Always oh, start the same. Why not? OK. It's a soft sell. They're not pushing it on you, but... OK. <laughs> Number one. Why not just jack each other off? <laughs> Look at that. I've got the new flyer, Larry. <laughs> what does it say? Well, let's have a look, shall we? Let's, let's do one now. OK. <laughs> no more up the arse for us. Number one. Why not just jack each other off? All right. Oh. <laughs> Number two. <laughs> Always oh, starts the same. Why not? Right. Number two. Why not just come on his back? <laughs> it's the casual nature of it. Like, like it's a recipe. Why not just throw in an onion? <laughs> Why'd you go to the doctor? Hi, doctor. I'm a gay man. I'm in a relationship. I'm worried about the threat of HIV. Is there anything I can do? Um, oh, just come on his back. <laughs> Number three. Number three. Oh, so I used to read this out to everyone I met, and they'd be laughing at number one and two. I'll get to number three, they'd go, hey, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Number three. <laughs> Why not just come in his hair? <laughs> not the hair. Not the hair. On the back, sure. <laughs> on the back, go on. On the back. Go on the back. Where are you fucking aiming that? No. <laughs> Not on the hair. No. No. There. There. I don't trust you. I'm putting on a shower cap. <laughs> Not the hair. Number four. Oh, OK. I have not before or since heard such great use of the term EG as in this next sentence. <laughs> Number four, why not try, try, so that people can think this is a bit difficult, like just please have a go, okay. <laughs> this isn't brain surgery, this next one, but they put in try, okay. Why not, <laughs> why not try coming into some fruit, <laughs> e.g. watermelon. <laughs> like they put that out without that bit, people are going, well what fruit, oh not a pineapple, fucking out. <laughs> What fruit? Just to, to be, uh, need to be specific. We thought asses were right. They're not. What fruit? Watermelon. Thank you. <sighs> and on and on. OK. I want to just skip ahead to number 10, OK? Because this may be the greatest sentence ever written. <laughs> I'm including Shakespeare in this. Dickens. The Office. Number... <laughs> Are you ready for this? Number 10, OK? Now, I think the bloke writing these was, was struggling by now. I think he'd gone into his boss and said, I've done it, I've come up with nine. The boss went, oh, we need 10. <laughs> really? Yeah, we need 10. I, I've, I've got nine. We, we, we need 10, really. I'm, I'm coming in hair and fruit and everything. I, <laughs> I mean, it's... We need 10, we need, need two roads of... Five. We need two rows of five, definitely. It's the, it's the symmetry I like. Just come up with another one. You've got half an hour. We go to print. You've got... Come, oh. So he went back in and he came up with number ten at one minute to six, I think. OK. Number ten. <laughs> Still with a why not. OK. Number ten. Absolutely real. Ready? Why not both come out of a window? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
<laughs> it doesn't even say if it's a first floor window. It's... It, it, but, morning. <laughs> no, this is number 17, number 19 this time. Thank you, morning. That's why it's my favourite leaflet of all time. Thank you. <laughs> Fun and education. I am trying to educate myself more. I've reached that age where I need knowledge. I feel guilty about not knowing enough. You know, I had a good education, but I didn't make the most of it, I think. And um, I've even stopped watching trash TV. Now, when I'm at home, I watch hours and hours of Discovery Channel and History Channel. Hours, Discovery Channel, History Channel. Ask me anything about sharks and Nazis. Um, <laughs> round of applause there for... There's not, they're, not, they're not as bad as a lot of people make out. Um, Sharks, I mean. <laughs> Nazis, awful. I, sharks, brilliant. Amazing creature. Okay. It can hone in on a floundering fish, right? Through the vibrations that it picks up through electrical impulses, through sensors in its flank. It doesn't need its eyes, but contrary to popular belief, their eyes are very good, okay? But it can smell and taste the slightest human secretion of blood and sweat, one part in a billion from a mile away. A shark would have found Anne Frank like that. <laughs> Nazis, rubbish. <laughs> I've been to her house, it's tiny. <laughs> Every day they went in. Okay, let's move on. Sarge, can we look upstairs today? <laughs> no, there's no one down here, move on. Sarge, what's that tapping? Just have time to write a book, for Christ's sake. Well, it ends a bit abruptly, and no sequel. Lazy. No, but... Not a traditional subject for comedy, the old Holocaust. But I will say something about the Holocaust, and I'm sticking my neck out here, but in my opinion, I blame Adolf Hitler. He was the ringleader. Old Adolf. That name's died out, hasn't it? <laughs> he killed that dead, didn't he? No one's calling their kid Adolf nowadays. No little Adolf's going to school. Loads of Brads and Angelinas, but no... Look, you don't hear the teacher doing the register. Brad here, Angelina here, Adolf here. <laughs> I do that quick so no one can take a picture of me doing that. Um, no, but... People make excuses for him. People say, oh, he was stupid, he was easily led, he didn't, he didn't mean that. What do you mean he didn't mean that? They say, oh no, he was influenced by the political philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche, right? Because Nietzsche wrote this paper um, talking about a superman. He said, not all men are born equal. And Hitler misinterpreted this and went way too far with it. And uh, <laughs> think of that. You're a great scholar, you've done this work, and you get a call from the Fuhrer. And the Fuhrer goes, all right, Nietzsche. He goes, yeah, good, what do you want? He goes, just read your book. What do you think? Love it. <laughs> Love all that. Man and Superman, not everyone's equal. Kill all the Jews. Sorry? <laughs> not everyone's equal, so kill all the Jews. I didn't write that. <laughs> I read between the lines. <laughs> I, I, I didn't mean that. That's terrible. Have you, you, haven't been kill, you, you haven't been killing Jewish people, have you? Have you been killing Jewish people? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> A few. How many? <coughs> six million. Six million? That's what I won't do anymore. Leave it. Leave it at six. That's terrible. I won't do any more. Stay for dinner? Well, I will, but be careful in future. I will. Are you writing any other books? Well, I am, but I'm scared to tell you about it. I won't do anything. What's your new book called? My new book is called The Gypsies. Do we need him, Mum? <laughs> Cheers. No, don't applaud that. We shouldn't, we shouldn't talk about such things. It's not like we're in peace times now, is it? There's a, a little thing going on in a country called Iraq, which is not my favourite war. My favourite war is... Um, <laughs> oh, so many. Um, they got uh, good for different reasons. Uh, ah, la, 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 la. Um, oh, uh, 
Brr. Falklands. That's <laughs> probably the Falklands because um, we won that one, and uh, it was great. It was against uh, Argentina. Yeah, <laughs> weird. Um, <laughs> we're going to war with Argentina. All right, okay, fair enough. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> the reason it's my uh, favourite war is that it, it was a range war, and what that means is the Argentine guns could fire nine kilometres. The British guns could fire 17 kilometres. So we just parked our ships 10 kilometres away and theirs were falling into the sea and we were shelling the shit out of them. It's the war equivalent of holding a midget at arm's length. And he's flailing and you're just kicking him in the bollocks like that. Vietnam, best soundtrack. Second World War, best ending. That had to be the end. That was a great finale. You couldn't follow that, could you? <laughs> People are worried about that. They go, oh, atomic energy. Oh, it's bad. The effects are still being felt today. But, oh, it ended a war. And that's good. And it was discovered by Einstein. And he's a genius. And in his 1903 paper, he said that light could be described as discrete bundles of energies that when irradiated onto an unstable... Ma what maniac thinks like that? Really? <laughs> I'm not a doctor, but I think that's what turns Stephen Hawking's mad, too much thinking. Do you know what I mean? The universe is expanding. Of course it is, Stephen. Yeah, yeah, of course it is, yeah. <laughs> Take a day off, go for a walk, not a walk, but I mean, just, no. <laughs> Open a window, watch a bit of TV, Robot Wars is on, you love that, don't you? <laughs> Greatest mind on the planet. <laughs> People say, oh, we shouldn't have a go at Stephen Hawking. Oh, he's a genius. He's not a genius, he's pretentious. <laughs> Born in Oxford and talks with that fake American accent. <laughs> he is actually a hero of mine. Um, not my greatest hero, my greatest hero is Nelson Mandela. Um, what a man, isn't he? He's an incredible man. Um, incarcerated for 25 years. He was released in 1990, he's been out about 18 years now. And he hasn't reoffended. <laughs> I think he's going straight. Which shows you prison does work. <laughs> I learnt a lot last year about one of your great American heroes, uh, Rosa Parks. It was the uh, 200 year celebration of the abolition of slavery in Britain last year. We were a bit ahead of you on that. <laughs> but well done. Um, <laughs> well done. But the abolition of slavery wasn't the end of racism. Racism was still inherent in society as late as the 50s and 60s in England and America. And it was this one incident that sparked off the civil rights movement. Uh, a young black woman called Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat to a white person on a bus. It was the law, but she'd had enough. And she was arrested for that. But then that law was changed. But she didn't stop there. She started sitting in those seats meant for disabled people. <laughs> She talked to the driver when the bus was in motion. <laughs> Did she have the correct change ready? Did she, bollocks. <laughs> oh, some people. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> I'm not a political comedian. <laughs> I used to be quite political. Growing up, that 15, 16 year old becoming aware and, well, you, you did it to annoy your parents, obviously, but um, I think we're inundated with politics from an early age. I think everything is charged with politics and morality and the way to live. Um, it's in everything, fables, nursery rhymes, little sayings. Um, I remember, I must have been as young as six, when we used to have an assembly at school, an infant school, we'd all come in every Monday and sit down on the floor cross-legged and our deputy headmaster used to come up and tell us a story. And it always had a moral that we were meant to think about and this would make us into leaders of men, character building. And he used to take ages over it. And he loved it, it was his best day, you know. And uh, I remember he told us about the two mice. The lazy mouse and the industrious mouse. And it was summer. And these two little mice were out in the woods. The sun was out, the streams were babbling, there were flowers, there were berries, 
I was nuts. I was, oh, and Lazy Mouse, he'd just be running around in the sun, having a bite from a berry, throwing the rest away. There was loads. It was never going to run out. <laughs> Industrious Mouse, he'd have a berry, sure, but he'd eat it all, and he'd put one away for a colder season. He knew. Lazy Mouse, he would, he'd be fucking running about sunbathing, <laughs> eating and chewing on it, throwing the rest away. Industrious Mouse went, oh, be careful, Lazy Mouse, because come winter, oh, fuck off, you square. <laughs> the fall comes, same sort of pattern. The last of the berries, he's chewing there, throwing the rest away, he's just like chilling out, he's kicking through the leaves. You can't see him, he's, if you saw the leaves moving, yeah. <laughs> He'd be under the leaves, basically. You'd go, what's that? It's Lazy Mouse underneath the leaf. If you could go under there, like the Discovery Channel, <laughs> you'd see Lazy Mouse going, fuck it. <laughs> Industrious Mouse. He'd be putting freeze-drying loads of berries. He'd be chopping wood, and, but he, 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 made, he made an axe to chop the wood here, <laughs> out of a little twig and a sliver of flint, which he tied on with a horse hair, <laughs> thus enabling him to chop and stockpile fuel. <laughs> so, winter comes, different pattern. The ground's hard, there's nothing, there's no fruit, there's no berries, there's no nuts, there's nothing at all on those trees. And he can't find anything, and he's, he's starving, and he's freezing, and he's losing his body weight, and, of course, industrious mouse. Now he's in his cottage that he built. <laughs> Somehow. Roaring log fire. Just sitting there, rocking. On a pebble. <laughs> Knock at the door. Who's that? Obvious, isn't it? <laughs> so he goes over the door. He opens the door. He's lazy mouse. And he goes... What do you want? He goes, I'm cold and I'm hungry. I can't find any food and I think I'm going to die. And he goes, well, I did warn you, didn't I? He goes, yeah. He goes, never mind. Come in here and share with me. Where's the moral there? <laughs> Fuck around, do what you want, and then scrounge up a do-good. That's a terrible moral for children, isn't it? <laughs> Awful. He told us the one about the boy who cried wolf. Have you heard that? Oh, well, I'm going to tell you again. Boy, in the Bible, I don't know. He's... I haven't got a specific year, have I? Right. Boy, looking after the, the sheep for the villagers. That's his job. Look after those sheep, boy. You go, All right, yeah. But he gets a bit bored. Probably gets a bit sleepy if he's counting them. Right. And he thinks, oh, I'll have a laugh here. He goes, wolf, wolf. And the villagers come up, and they go, where's the wolf? He goes, there's no wolf. They go, oh, you can't. <laughs> so next day, he gets bored again. He thinks, that worked a treat. He's got very little imagination. He goes, I'll do that again. Okay. <laughs> so he goes, wolf, wolf. Where's the wolf? There's no wolf. Oh, you can't. <laughs> so the next day, he's sitting there. There really is a wolf. And the wolf comes up, and he goes, wolf, 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 wolf. But the villagers don't come, and the wolf eats all the sheep. And we were told the moral of that is never tell a lie. No, it isn't. <laughs> the moral of that is never tell the same lie twice. <laughs> Again, a terrible moral for children. Nursery rhymes. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pile of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown, which I later learned meant his cranium. <laughs> I thought his hat fell off. <laughs> and Jill came tumbling after. And that's a true fable of 16th century lovers who used to go up to the, the well behind the prying eyes of the villagers and their spouses and have it away. And what's the moral there, though? Don't fuck around with sluts or you get your head caved in. <laughs> How is that applicable to five-year-olds? I have never worked out the moral to Humpty Dumpty. <laughs> Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. 
all I can think is, don't sit on a wall if you're an egg. <laughs> but again, how is that applicable to a five-year-old human? I mean, you tell that to a group of five, oh, so don't sit on a wall if you're an egg. Oh, what do you mean if I'm an egg? I'm not an egg. I'm not... Uh, it doesn't make sense. If I'm in, I win, none of us are eggs. If there was an egg there, it would make sense. Can you go to the egg, don't sit on a wall, you go, I'm an egg, I can't eat, I've got nothing, I've got no ears, no eyes, I don't know what the fuck. What? Don't sit on a wall, I can't fucking hear, I don't, I don't, I've got nothing. This is, I mean nothingness. I can't fucking climb walls for a start, so. <laughs> don't send horses to perform medical procedures. Of course they couldn't put him together again. <laughs> They've got no dexterity whatsoever. They can't sew to save their lives. They're, they've got no thumbs, let alone opposable thumbs. They're, don't send a, send a horse, it's delicate. An egg? We've got a cracked egg. Should we send a horse? Definitely not. <laughs> Have you got a doctor or someone who works for Fabergé? Don't. We've, 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 we've got like a half a ton creature with no fingers. No. <laughs> Don't send that. Got a four-legged thing with like that. No, no. No chance. They, they, they can't, they put, couldn't put on, they couldn't scrub up. They can't. <laughs> Magic, there's an egg. Delicate egg. Horse comes over. <laughs> Fucked. <laughs> it, it couldn't, they wouldn't even think of. <laughs> Fucked. That's it. <laughs> They wouldn't even see it. They'd go over there. What? Fuck. That's it. <laughs> wouldn't even. You couldn't explain it to it. Don't send. It's ridiculous. If I had to design the perfect egg crushing device, it would be a hoof. <laughs> I need this. Uh, as a cracked egg. I need it crushing completely. Hoof. <laughs> the hoof's great. D don't send your. Well, it doesn't matter whether they're the king's horses or not. Don't. S <laughs> certainly don't send all of them. That's going to be chaos! <laughs> if there was one horse with a little bit of nails, he had a job, he did like one year before he got kicked out of Harvard. He could have, I'd know the rudimentary stuff. They all go, fuck it, ah, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> there's, there's no lads, don't, ah, oh, they're fucking all over it. <laughs> fucked. It's definitely fucked now. <laughs> what if we'd have invaded by France that day? And there, all, bloke comes running up the hill and goes, are you in charge of all the king's horses? All the king's men? <laughs> yep. The French are coming. What? The French are coming. Where are all the king's horses? I set them to mend an egg. You don't be gun. What do you mean you set them to mend a fucking egg? Oh. If your surname is Dumpty, don't call your firstborn Humpty. What sort of a stigma is that? For a kid that's already an egg? They have a piss ripped out of him. I bet he jumped off the wall. <laughs> but you were... Uh, I don't think you learn things from that. I don't think you learn things like that sneaky way through things like that, teachers and parents. I think your formative years are your peers. That's what you want to be like when you're in adolescence. You want to be like, you know, the cool boy or the older boy. And luckily I went to a school where all the other boys were idiots. <laughs> and one in particular was amazing. He was called David Beasley, and I don't know the politically correct term, but he was a fucking moron. <laughs> I actually based Gareth from The Office on him, and that's true. So you can imagine, yeah, exactly, he's very much like that. Thank you. Um, and we were about 14, okay? And this is the sort of thing he used to come up with. He used to believe anything that was idiotic, okay? With confidence, apocryphal tales, just things he'd heard. Right, right, okay, so. He came in once, we were about 14, and he said, Right? It's amazing, right? When you get captured by cannibals, big problem in Reading, where I come from. <laughs> he said, when you get captured by cannibals, they show you pornographic pictures, so you get an erection, there's more meat to go around. <laughs> that would work, wouldn't it? There they are, cooking you in the pot. You're boiling, screaming, going, please don't kill me. They go, look at that, you go. <laughs> when he was about 
15, 16, he went on holiday with his parents and he put a crab in a pint of beer because I told him, as a joke, that when a crab is drunk, it can walk forwards. <laughs> the crab, of course, drowned, right? And he came back on holiday and went, you're talking shit, Gervais. <laughs> Unbelievable. He, uh, this is what he confessed to us once. I remember we were in biology class, and it was before the lesson, and he came in, and he went, oh, I've got to tell you this, All right? He didn't. When you hear the story, you realise he didn't have to tell us this. <laughs> he said, I was masturbating last night. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> he said, I was up in my room, and he said, I was naked, with my eyes shut, with headphones on, listening to music, as you do. <laughs> Sting. <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. I don't know why I said that. I have never masturbated to sting in my life. Let's nip that one in the bag. <laughs> so he's there, naked, eyes shut, it's the music. He said, I finished, he said, and when I opened my eyes, my mum had been in and left me some tea and biscuits. <laughs> now, he didn't have to tell us that, did he? Why would he tell me that? <laughs> but let's think of that scenario. Let's think of the mother. So the mother goes up the stairs with a tray. He loves his tea and biscuits. Uh, David. Oh, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Oh, dear. There's my firstborn. Whacking away like a little monkey. Well, I could just leave and he'd never know I was here. Or... I could put these by his bed, and he'd know his mum saw him coming all over himself. <laughs> Think of that, your mother walking in on you masturbating. The other way round's worse. <laughs> <sighs> 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 mum, shut the door. <laughs> mum, give me my CD back, it's Sting. <laughs> oh. He told us a very funny story that didn't involve him, actually. Um, it was true, because it made the local paper. It was about this guy. We were about 14, 15, so this was like amazing news to us. And this other guy was an older boy, I think he was like 17. And it was a bit of a scandal, because he got prosecuted for lewd behaviour. And what this bloke did, he went down to the, the public toilets, and he found one of those dodgy toilets, and he sat there. You know, the, the hole in the cubicle, right? The glory hole they're called. I don't know who invented them. I don't know who thought, hold on, I love cocks, I hate faces, I'm going to pop a little hole <laughs> just there, wait long enough, a cock come through, and it did! How do these things get around? Who invents them? Who does that? And then thinks that'll take off. And then, did someone just go in and sleep one day, just for, I don't know, piss, and then, oh, there's a little hole there. <laughs> it's probably for my cock, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. So he went down to his public toilet, okay, sat there for hours, okay, waited by the hole, people in and out. Eventually someone comes in, rustles around, a cock comes through, ooh. <laughs> he sucked him off. What do you think he was going to do? <laughs> he's only there for one thing. Oh, play a little tune on it. No, he's going <laughs> to put a bolt through it and leave. That <laughs> 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 happened, now you're fucked. Right. <laughs> yeah. So he sucked him off, and when they went outside, it was his dad. <laughs> I've had that in my head for 30 years, now you live with it. <laughs> oh. All the toothpaste in the world. Take the teeth out, dentist. Take, take the gums out as well. Which one of them blabbed that around town, then? That bloke went, Hi, honey, I'm home. Good day, dear. Yeah, I saw Toby. <laughs> How was he? He was all right. <laughs> I will tell you one um, story before I go. Uh, it is toilet-related. Yeah. When I um, first moved in 
with my girlfriend 20 odd years ago. Our first apartment together was a horrible little place in the worst area in London called King's Cross. Oh, horrible. It was a red light district and it was a seedy place, but it's all we could afford. And it was one room, okay, but it had like a little kitchenette area. So, for our own sort of sanity, we moved the little single bed into the kitchen bit. So it was like a one bedroom apartment. So, anyway. So at night, we're in a room this big, okay? The bed literally just fit in. I had to push it down the wall to get it in. And it came over the doorway about six inches. And in bed, I could open the fridge door. <laughs> the fridge was there, the cooker was there, and the sink was there. There was no toilet. The toilet was a shared toilet with all the other apartments in the block, and it was two floors down. So, what wins in the middle of the night when I need a wee? Putting on trousers and going outside, or just pop into the sink? <laughs> that one. And I remember Jane, 20 odd years ago, in a sleepy state, saying, I'll at least take the dishes out first. <laughs> I didn't. I used to get hold of the bottom plate, lift them all up, and wee straight down the plug hole. Thank you very much. You've been fantastic. Cheers. Encores in other professions, do you? If you're a builder, you do a great job, and you go, cheers, you go, come back, and go, what? Come back, all right. It's a good job I left a bit. <laughs> I was talking earlier about um, trying to educate myself, and that is true. And I think, you know, um, the internet is probably the greatest resource of information the world has ever seen. It's amazing. And uh, online encyclopedias that you can go into and change. You can't do that in a library, can you, really? You can't just get down inside a pee. What are you doing, mate? Just changing a bit. <laughs> Fuck off. There's loads of websites just clogging up the internet by people that are doing websites about themselves. It's like, my name is Rupert, this is my cat, I like the cure. Who gives a fuck? <laughs> And the trivia sites, where just people just load up things they've learned. And I just think, what, do they wake up in a cold sweat and go, I've got to tell the world this, the peanut is not a nut, it's a legume. <laughs> but my favourite, my favourite, are the animal facts. The animal facts are just, I think, incredible. This is from a website called Deb and Jen's World of Knowledge. Okay? And I want you to think about the people who put this up, okay? They're not just the fact, but who did it and why they did it. What, what, what were they thinking? Okay. Number one, you can lead a cow upstairs, but not down. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I looked into that, it's true. A cow will go upstairs, but they won't go downstairs because the way their joints don't oppose. But I think of the poor bastard who found that out the hard way. <laughs> Come on, Daisy, down you go. I don't go downstairs. Come on. No, I don't go downstairs my way with joints. I don't care about your joints. My wife's coming home from work in five fucking minutes. Get down the stairs. <laughs> you thought, yeah, I've got to tell other people about this. <laughs> Number two. Stroking a spider can cause it to go bald. <laughs> Thanks. One, what sort of maniac goes around stroking spiders? Dracula's assistant. I don't know. <laughs> Two, is that a problem in the arachnid world? Premature balding? <laughs> Do they worry about that much? I thought they'd be, they'd be loving it, wouldn't they? Being a skinhead, they're so fucking hard. <laughs> Got all the legs, all the eyes, the teeth. Fuck it, I'm bald. Who cares? <laughs> Adds to it. I like it more. <laughs> but no, apparently it's a big, big problem. You stroke a little spider, he goes, oh, fucking you know. <laughs> He runs back to the web, and all the other spiders go, what are you wearing a baseball cap for? <laughs> Fashion. <laughs> Bit weird. Nah, it's just... Fashion. <laughs> we'll take it off in the web. Nah, I'll just keep, I'll just keep it on. <laughs> a bit cold. Cold? We're in a cupboard under the sink, it's boiling. <laughs> nah, take it off. Nah, take it off. Uh, oh.
Have you been letting a human stroke you? <laughs> Leave this fucking web. <laughs> Number three. Polar bears will sometimes cover their black nose during a hunt to camouflage themselves more completely. It's a good idea, isn't it? Because uh, part of the old nose are perfectly camouflaged. They're white, the snow's white. So they're sneaking up on little Arctic hare. And they get there, and the Arctic hare, he turns around. The polar bear goes... Behavioural. All the polar bears sitting around one night going, I'm starving. Every time I sneak up in a little hair, he looks round and he hops off. It's like he can see me. I can't, I can't work out. <laughs> little voice, little hair goes, I can tell you. Can you see us? Well, I can see where you are and how many there are of you. Really? How? You'll kick yourself. No, go on, tell us. Your nose is black. <laughs> the nose, it's black. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> Can you see us now? <laughs> no? Um. <laughs> Thank you. My favourite fact. Okay. Number four. Montana mountain goats will sometimes butt heads so hard that their hooves fall off. <laughs> Can that be true? That's amazing. So there's two there. They're looking at a female goat. One goes, I like her. And the other goes, yeah, I'm probably going to mate with her. Well, now I saw her first. That's not how it works. How does it work? We have to run at each other really hard and crack heads. Is that safe? Oh, yeah. Okay, go. Oh! Ow! Ow! Oh! Look! <laughs> yeah. Yours all right? Yeah. I grip on impact. <laughs> Did you know about this? <laughs> Why don't you tell me? Mortal enemies. <laughs> Never mind that, my fucking feet are falling off. <laughs> One more amazing fact. Elephants have been caught swimming up to two miles off the coast in the Indian Ocean. That's amazing. I didn't know they liked to swim. I certainly didn't think they could swim two miles out to sea. But it's the language this person uses. I've been caught swimming. <laughs> like it's illegal. <laughs> Says the Coast Guard. Morning. Morning. <whistles> Morning. <whistles> Phone rings. Ring, ring. Hello. They're doing what? <laughs> no, I'll be there. That's me in a little boat. I'm not jacking a bloke off behind me. I'm just... <laughs> what are you doing? Nothing. It's not nothing, is it? What's that? Beach ball. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing. Don't look at him. What I'm, I'm to, What are you doing? Swimming. Yeah, you are. Do you know how far off coast you are? <laughs> Two miles. Is it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. You know you're not meant to do this, don't you? Don't 
cry. <laughs> but if you know you're not meant to do it, I've told you loads of times, why are you doing it again? I forgot. Get in the fucking boat. Thanks very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.